So thank you everybody for attending. We will have uh, three uh, speeches now. The first is from Paul Bitsuk. I don't know if it's well pronounced. <laughs> if not, I'm sorry. Bitsuk. I will present myself later. Obviously. Okay, from the University of Ghana. And he's going to uh, speak about the necessity of live performances. Thank you very much. You, you can uh, talk. <laughs> okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Michal Biedziuk. I'm a PhD candidate in philosophy at the University of Gdańsk in Poland. And uh, my presentation is entitled uh, Performance as a Freedom from Terrible Pressure of the Will. A uh, small explanation here because in original abstract, the, this quote uh, looks uh, a bit different because it's quotes from Arthur Schopenhauer work uh, uh, Die Welt as uh, Wille und Vorstellung. And uh, when I was translate, translating this uh, uh, title uh, over two years ago, I was using very old translation, uh, English translation. And now I uh, um, uh, used the most accurate one, the newest one translation. So that's small explanation. And the subtitle is on the necessity of live performances to maintain the validity of Peter Kivy's cognitive concept of musical uh, signification. Uh, first, I have the first general uh, uh, remark. What is the purpose of the analysis of musical signification on the ground of philosophy? I think that it's very important to say something about that. Uh, on the ground on semiotics, psychology, history, etc., we are rather looking what uh, music is uh, signified, what is signified by the music, what is the cultural importance of music and many other things. And uh, in my, in my uh, presentation, I will focus on purely philosophical uh, core of this uh, analysis, uh, which is what music is in itself. Uh, and uh, it sometimes uh, demands from us to answer the question, where should we look? So what, what is music, basically? Uh, before I start presentation, uh, uh, two small remarks after two years, because I sent, I apply for this conference over two years ago, and I have I have a few uh, thoughts about uh, philosophy of uh, music uh, generally. Uh, first is uh, that uh, I see that um, in philosophy general some tendency to uh, treat uh, art, uh, like Rudiger Bubner said, uh, as a medium in which philosophy tries to ascertain its own theoretical status. So philosophy does not say what art is, rather art should show what philosophy is. And this remark is connected with the second one, that uh, um, uh, I think that uh, this discussion uh, in uh, on the philosophical ground about uh, musical signification uh, is uh, quite inconclusive, and I'm deeply convinced that it's because uh, we lost some um, uh, holistic uh, perspective in philosophy, and holistic for me means systematic. So. So maybe we should return to some kind of a systemic uh, thinking in philosophy, maybe not in the style of German idealism, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, could, we should uh, think, uh, we, we should um, revitalize the concept of beauty. Maybe this concept for someone is not uh, politically correct, but I think that it's uh, uh, very important. And uh, speak, uh, um, when we are um, studying the uh, musical signification, we should also focus on aesthetic experience uh, as a non-discursive uh, form of uh, cognition. Uh, I will uh, go back to this remark uh, at the end. So, What's my presentation plan? Uh, first, I will present uh, positions in uh, disputes, and I will uh, depend here uh, mainly on Peter Kivy's uh, work, uh, Music Alone. Uh, 
I basically share his view uh, on uh, the main positions in this so-called squirrel. Uh, first, I will present uh, a criticism of uh, emotivism, of musical emotivism, uh, partly by me and partly by Kiwi, criticism of uh, radical cognitivism position. Uh, and then I will present uh, how Kiwi uh, perform transition from emotivism to, cog to cognitivism or to some form of cognitive emotivism. And then I will show uh, the uh, Kiwi's uh, errors <laughs> and uh, uh, try to fill this, uh, uh, um, repair these errors by presenting some elements of Arthur Schopenhauer uh, theory uh, of music. Mm, uh, I will show that uh, how how he uh, explaining how uh, cognition through art is possible and especially especially uh, by uh, by music. And uh, <laughs> uh, I will also show the main faults of Schopenhauer theory. And uh, in conclusions, uh, uh, I will try to. Uh, doing some synthesis of both theory of Peter Kiwi and uh, Schopenhauer. So what's uh, the positions in this so-called, by me, quarrel uh, between emotivism and cognitivism? What's this? So uh, in, uh, on, on the left side of this quarrel, on the emotivism side, we've got basically two uh, streams of thinking. Uh, one of which Kiwi is uh, speaking is uh, a stimulus model. Uh, so the music stimulates us like uh, alcohol or some chemical substance and uh, emotions arise. The second uh, stream of emotivism is uh, um, uh, divided in subdivisions. Uh, uh, we can say that music express ordinary emotions, so the real life emotions. Uh, Kiwi says that, for example, it can be fear of being kidnapped by gypsies. <laughs> uh, and the second subdivision would be uh, that music express objectless emotions, uh, like a floating fear inside of the night. We just feel fear of we don't know what. On the right side, uh, there are two streams of uh, uh, musical cognitivism uh, and uh, the first position is uh, very radical i may say that music meaning is purely formal uh, formal or uh, structural so uh, uh, it basically if we uh, look at the music score we will see all the meaning uh, which is in the music so the question is what for we need a performance and the second uh, position is uh, that the meaning of music is about, it, it's a Kiwi's position. Uh, the, the meaning of music is about unconscious belief or, or system of beliefs about its uh, expressive qualities. And this expressive quality is the musical beauty generally. So uh, let's be more specific and uh, few words about the stimulus model. Uh, Kiwi says that if a piece of music makes someone sad or frightened or despairing or angry, you can be sure the reaction is either personal or uh, pathological. And uh, at the other place, I knew someone who became enraged every time she heard Brahms' second symphony. I might be very well think uh, myself in the presence of pathological condition that required psychoanalytic untangling. So Kiwi uh, is saying that uh, uh, the stimulus model uh, directs us to, towards a uh, uh, pathological model of listening. Uh, and he means by that, that we are uh, hearing not, uh, we are reacting not to uh, musical expressiveness, but we are putting into understanding of music, our own uh, own emotions, uh, uh, and we are not controlling uh, those emotions. If we listen to music in that way, that's uh, he says, the listen uh, listeners failure, not the composer success. Um, 
about the the second stream and first subdivision in emotivism. So when we treat music like uh, we say that music express ordinary emotions, here is uh, here Kivi is more um, more specific, I may say. And he says that music cannot express real uh, life emotions because it lacks emotional material. And what is uh, this uh, emotional material? He says that we all have a general idea of how real life emotions get aroused in us in our everyday intercourse with our fellow human beings. But music does not seem able to supply the necessary emotive materials that these experiences do. What exactly can be these uh, uh, materials? Uh, it's uh, uh, the example of Uncle Charlie. Uh, uh, and I should read this uh, quote uh, in extenso because it will be important for uh, further uh, presentation. When Uncle Charlie, for the 100th time, tells the story of how Aunt Bella was the cause of his failure in business, which I know to be a self-serving falsehood, I, I feel my anger rise and I resist to impulse to punch him in the nose or give him the dressing down he deserves. I know why Uncle Charlie makes me angry and how. And I know who I'm angry at, Uncle Charlie, of course. All of these essential conditions, however, seem to be lacking in the situations in which I would describe a piece of music as angry and as moving, situations in which the emotivists insist the music is moving me to anger. Who or what am I angry at? At the music? At the composer? How was I made angry by a structure of artfully put together sounds? And why? Where is the Uncle Charlie? There is no Uncle Charlie, and the emotivist knows it as well as I. Uh, maybe it's uh, a bit sim simplified by Kiwi, but uh, it's a funny anecdote. It's the character of Kiwi's style that, that he uses um, some uh, such a funny anecdotes, like being kidnapped by. Uh, gypsies, but I think it, it, it uh, points very well the uh, the uh, main problem with uh, with ordinary emotions uh, in emotivist uh, position. Now uh, uh, let's focus on the uh, radical cognitive cognitivism. There is a mistake in uh, uh, numeration. He should be number one, not three. So uh, why pure formal cognitivism is incorrect? If it's only the formal meaning of the music that matters, it's enough to study the score. Yeah, But uh, the score, however, is only a help for the musician's imagination, says Kivi. So in a loose sense of uh, uniquely, a score uniquely determines uh, a correct performance under a given set of implicit conventions for interpreting the score. Conventions which may be quite different in different historical contexts. And a performance uniquely determines a score under a similar set of historically bound conventions for, uh, for taking musical uh, dictations. So, um, Music score is not enough. And now I'm heading to the uh, second uh, position on cognitivism side, uh, which is about some unconscious beliefs which are um, provoked or uh, provided by musical uh, uh, meaning. And Kiwi says that uh, uh, musical expression evokes belief in its beauty, but not emotions. He says exactly that the, the belief on which my emotion is predicated will simply be the rather uncomplicated conviction that what I am hearing is very, very beautiful. Uh, uh, a small digression uh, about language here, uh, because uh, uh, I think that uh, in Polish, uh, the, the English words 
belief and conviction has generally maybe i'm wrong but uh, but these meanings are generally uh, provided by the same word uh, which is przekonanie and uh, as uh, we see the belief it could be a przekonanie as a faith or opinion and uh, for conviction it would be przekonanie może uh, or przeświadczenie uh, przekonanie as a re reliability rather so it's a bit confusing for it was a bit confusing for me to understand how the belief can produce uh, conviction uh, because in polish translation it's uh, it's not so uh, so clear so here it says that music uh, in this move from belief to uncomplicated conviction that music is beautiful that this move is like transporting him when when moved by music i'm transported as it were and cannot be consciously entertaining beliefs about how the music is going. Okay, so he tried to show that uh, uh, musical beliefs could be uh, as well uh, um, unconscious or uh, affective, like uh, real uh, life emotions. But I, I'm asking if it's uh, not uh, going into the shoes of emotivism again. So uh, it may be called self-abolishing cognitivism because if music poses uh, an object like Uncle Charlie, which is the beauty of the music itself, whatever that means, then experiencing music is essentially the same as experiencing emotions. It's essentially the same way of experiencing uh, emotions. So it could be like in even in a stimulus uh, model, when we drink alcohol and we feel dizzy, when we are uh, look, uh, hearing to music, we just uh, being aroused by some beliefs uh, 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 and we have no control about this belief. I don't think that uh, it's the essence of what um, Cognitivism, cognitivists' uh, uh, position has as a uh, as its uh, goal, uh, because uh, being moved by music is not the same as uh, being tra transported, like Kivi calls it. Uh, Kivi calls uh, says that he's transported, yeah, uh, because music does not move us because it uh, uh, stimulates emotions but because it forces us to transcend our inner feeling rather in being moved by music we get to know something beyond our feeling uh, and knowing depends on the activities of the will uh, there is no out of the box cognition in ordinary sense and self-creating beliefs certainly uh, do not exist. But is this really so? And now arrives Arthur Schopenhauer. What Schopenhauer uh, could say about uh, the moving force of art and music? What really moves us? And Schopenhauer answers that uh, it is uh, die Wille, the will. What is the will, uh, short uh, explanation, what is the will in Schopenhauer philosophy it, it's it's quite specific uh, for him because he was fascinated with with uh, uh, upanishadas with uh, indian philosophy uh, he was also a bit uh, arrogant especially for uh, fichte Schelling, and hegel and was very critical about them and he was also critical about kant so for uh, schopenhauer there is only one will so individual expressions of will are merely human wanting motives and an uh, empirical character of each uh, individual. Uh, the will is some pan-cosmic force uh, uh, which permeates the whole world like Bergsonian Alain Vital. And uh, knowing or under understanding the will is hard but it is possible and it is the main difference from Kant 
who uh, teach that things in themselves are uh, unknowable. And the third thing about Schopenhauerian will is that will manifests uh, itself at the levels of objectification. Objectif objectification of the but the object objectification of the will imprisons us in our singularity so we are trapped in representations we can say because uh, uh, well the world as we know is uh, is real but its particular existence is experienced by us only by representation Vorstellung, the German word, uh, um, word for this is. And in the uh, small digression, in the uh, first translation, English translation, Haldane and Kemp uh, translated uh, Vorstellung as idea, which was very confusing. So we see only representations, we are trapped in uh, representations. Uh, the world uh, intuited in space and time, which manifests itself as pure causality, is completely real. The world is exactly as it presents itself, and it presents itself completely and without reserve as a representation held together by the law of causality. So where are this law? And the answer is uh, quite Kantian at this stage in Schopenhauer philosophy that this uh, conditions, these laws are inside uh, cognizing subject. The representation of the world is conditioned by a transcendental ideality, which somehow illuminates, Schopenhauer don't use this word, but I think it's correct. It illuminates the subject from uh, within. So the representations are conditioned by the subjects, but we don't have a direct uh, knowledge uh, of uh, the source of this uh, uh, conditioning uh, power. And uh, so our cognition is uh, limited uh, and if uh, uh, if would not be uh, so, uh, uh, if the ideas are supposed to be object of condition, the cognition will be possible only when individuality is suppressed in the cognitive subject. So in pure unclouded condition, we would in fact no longer recognize particular things, events, change or multiplicity, and I will add here, and ourselves, but only ideas, only the steps on the ladder of the objectivation of that one will of the true thing in itself, says, says Schopenhauer. And the most perfect condition, uh, or maybe uh, the only one, uh, uh, which uh, which can reach the will itself in Schopenhauer theory is cognition through art. Uh, because art repeats the eternal ideas, he says, grasped through pure contemplation, it repeats what is essential and enduring in all the appearances of the world. Art originates in the condition of the ideas alone, and its only goal is the communication of this condition. So we can liberate from this uh, uh, terrible pressure of the will through the arts. I will not read all this quote, but it's the essence of uh, cognition through uh, the art that it serves uh, re liberating from the terrible pressure of the will. And the music is the most perfect way uh, of the of the objectification uh, of the will in Schopenhauer view. So, because the music he says is a, uh, it's the I think the most famous quote. The music is a direct copy of the will itself. So it's embodied music, uh, as well as. Uh, uh, so the world is embodied, embodied music as embodied will. Uh, it all sounds very beautiful. I'm heading to uh, final conclusions, but first I must present the uh, mistakes of Schopenhauer's theory. Uh, first of all, uh, Schopenhauer's uh, um, opinion about Kant was uh, mainly positive, but he uh, he said that uh, it was Kant's omission 
to postulate uh, uh, things in themselves. Uh, because uh, in Schopenhauer's view, there is uh, something like think in themselves, think in the uh, think in itself, which we can uh, uh, know, uh, which we uh, can uh, um, understand, and that is uh, that is the will, in his view, and so in Schopenhauer's view, Kant was wrong at this uh, question, but uh, the things in themselves were the core of Kantian. Uh, philosophy and especially practical philosophy, because the idea of freedom, especially, uh, is uh, the uh, the core of his uh, concept of duty, of his moral law. It's not the time to speak about this thing, but uh, we should just now understand that it was uh, the the most important for Kant, and it was surely not his omission. I think. And the second uh, mistake uh, in my view is that Schopenhauer, it's connected with the first, uh, that Schopenhauer says uh, uh, about will, but it's not will at all. It's rather a total uh, uh, determination of our uh, uh, will. So our uh, uh, will to decide uh, is just an illusion because we are trapped in these representations, in these levels of object, objectification. Uh, so we can uh, liberate toward not deciding at all. So it's not uh, about freedom, I think. It's uh, self-contradictory. So that's the main uh, fault of uh, Schopenhauer's in my view, but uh, there are some things which we can use from Schopenhauer philosophy and from the Kiwi's uh, theory of uh, uh, musical uh, meaning. Kiwi uh, was uh, trying to narrow the range of uh, uh, the search by uh, trying to define what is music uh, alone. We could say pure music. And uh, because it is the right object for research in cognitive uh, position. Uh, and I think that his answer uh, about what is music alone is not very convincing because he, uh, he uh, he puts himself on some platonic uh, uh, position. Uh, but we can um, improve uh, uh, this, this concept of music alone by uh, performing a test of musical performance, uh, especially uh, in the uh, situation when, when uh, uh, I am playing music for myself or I'm singing for myself, because uh, uh, I'm uh, also a, a, a graduate in uh, music. Uh, I'm a quite well pianist and singer, and I noticed that uh, when I'm playing, uh, especially for myself, there is no auditory, or uh, especially singing, uh, when I try to uh, get aroused by some uh, emotions or expressiveness, which is not um, a part of music itself, it is harder to perform. When I have some uh, mournful song and I, start, and, I, uh, and I start to cry, my uh, uh, breath uh, would go uh, shallow, my uh, uh, throat will uh, uh, squeeze, and it will it will be technical uh, uh, hard or even impossible to uh, to perform. So uh, if if uh, but when uh, when I am uh, focusing on uh, uh, purely musical expressiveness, uh, I'm in a state of some kind of meditation. I'm conscious but I'm not focusing on uh, things uh, external to the, to the music itself. So in the Schopenhauer uh, sense, in the Schopenhauerian sense, 
I'm afraid if I'm uh, liberated from the terrible pressure of the will. Uh, uh, and it's not a contradiction uh, in this uh, uh, situation. And this, uh, I call this uh, Schopenhauer test, uh, could help us to define what is music alone. And uh, it's, uh, it's not only about uh, looking the musical meaning, but uh, about uh, defining what is the beautiful music or uh, good music, because uh, returning to my second remark, if we are uh, uh, leaving the uh, realm of uh, aesthetic experience, we cannot uh, conclusively uh, answer uh, the question about what is music, what is uh, musical meaning. And that is all which I uh, prepared for you and I'm looking forward for questions. Thank you very much, Michal. Uh, do we have any questions for me? Yes, please go on. So, uh, Michal, thank you for your presentation. It was uh, very inspiring. And uh, one of the concepts that you were articulate very commonly. Uh, well, well, some of them are very controversial, but uh, another one that you deal with is good music and music that's not good. Uh, I'd like uh, you to be clearer uh, with respect to what you were calling good music and what would not be good music uh, in your exposition. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, could I share a screen one more time? Um, because I've got a slide which I don't use. Um, it would be helpful. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. The, uh, um, yeah. I, I know that saying about good art or bad art is uh, controversial uh, nowadays. Uh, but uh, um, I think it, it's important to make a, a basic distinction. And I know that, uh, uh, for example, kitsch is also treated like uh, fully uh, value art. Uh, but uh, I mean the kitsch in the um, uh, basic basic meaning. And uh, I found a good definition in Maria Poprzenska uh, book. Uh, for kitsch perception, it's appro appropriate to familiarize, to tame, and reduce everything to a form known from common experience. So if we are uh, uh, reducing uh, um, the meaning of music, the meaning of art, or um, the meaning it itself to the common experience, so the uh, then uh, the Cognition is uh, is um, impossible because we are putting to things meaning that uh, only we can uh, understand, and uh, the, the 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 bad music uh, provokes us for such uh, uh, immanence, I could say, so uh, to such immanent uh, feeling of uh, emotions and immanent understanding of. The meaning. There, there could be basically no such thing as immanent understanding because understanding should be in somehow uh, uh, intersubjectively uh, understood. So when I speak about good music, it's a, a music that can be understood in, in a, such a way. Thank you very much. Good morning to all of you. I think you you are uh ah the video you we're going to listen to I, I, a pre-recorded video of this yes presentation. I, I, I prepare a pre-recorded video because it would be more, uh, safer uh, for the uh, for the intent of the content 
So if you can. Sure, we, we, we are. Yes, this, this, yes. It's a 20 time video. So uh, if you consider that it could be enough time for the performance of the piece in which I center on, uh, you can say after the video, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not necessary, of course, but it could be an option. But first of all, let's roll the video. If you, if you how, how long is it, the piece? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, OK. OK. <laughs> Good morning. First of all, it's my pleasure to thank the Committee of the Congress for accepting this discussion. I deeply regret not being able to be there, but an unexpected arrhythmia prevented me from traveling next to you. So uh, I will try to explain my ideas in this recording as I agreed with the coordination staff. This presentation has its origin in the methodological part of my master's thesis since it was prepared in 2019 for submission to this campus. Currently, this methodology is helping me to work on the homage that current Spanish composers have paid to Spanish composers of the past. I hope you enjoy. Thank you. As a piano student and teacher, finding motivations to make decisions in my practice as pianist and chamber musician is the primus motor of my searching. The content of this lecture of methodological focus will lead us from sound theoretical basis to analysis, semiotics and performance. Whether reading or listening to a piece of music, every performer can or should wonder about the composer's intentions. In the same way, what decisions were captured by the composer in the text and how this influenced their own decisions in <coughs> the act of performing. I think that the tools in the realm of semiotics could be useful and productive. Thus, I propose a dialogue course between performance and semiotics with the support of analysis. For the understanding of the musical text in the search of a semiotic informed musical utterance. My hypothesis is that this dialogue is capable of enriching the reading of each of all these three disciplinary fields. So, first of all, I will propose a quick critical review of the concepts that come into play, to then explore a particular contemporary repertoire, Lamento by Edson Sampronia, a special work in which melody is not a constructive feature for trying to tighten and exploit my methodology. In this way, I'll analyze this piece from a parametric perspective, applying semiotic tools to understand how the repertoire works in the act of performance, with the main final objective of establishing integrative discursive bridges between the three previous perspectives. In the research work, that serve as the basis for this presentation, I took note of these terms and made a review of the status of these issues. Beyond the double articulation of language following Martinet, the capabilities for transferring sounds in music are based on its own intrinsic means speech, rhythm, loudness, timbre, intervallic relations, dynamics, agogics, etc. and all the combinatory and changes among them. These 
are miserable features that act on each musical event and denote a straightforward meaning. A reasonably associated sense of personal description of meaning would emerge from looking at all these music features and gestures. But if that look is not based on those, any attempt would be a desiderative corollary, just a wish. For me, it's a very reasonable step moving forward from here to Tarasti's 194 theory and his analysis of isotopies or musical events. All of this will be important later. The states that he proposes for the music events of being, doing, becoming or seeming and their own characteristics of spatiality, temporality or actoriality, as well as the roles or modalities associated to the content of these states, know, must, can and will. Once again, the step from modalities to modalization of the performer will be a coherent path. I've explored the usefulness of some of the Peirce's trichotomies and, as can be seen in the graph, in a more accurate way in relation to firstness, secondness and thirdness. Thus, I analyzed both the position of the composer in the creation process and the role of the interpreter as receiver and producer of a new reflected musical message. This positioning is in relation to Molinona Tia's tripartition, but without giving up a structuralist analysis. As a performer, I like to highlight the interesting position as receiver and producer of another layer of meaning for the dialogue between semiotics and sound realization. In the reading and reflection of the analysis, I resorted to Sapiro and Hutton's <coughs> markedness of the musical events, sometimes going through processes of polarization for the assignment of musical sense. Both analytical and performative tools will be based on the conversion of sound qualities into descriptive characteristics of musical events. These will be related to some kind of continuity or discontinuity in the discourse. Melodic, rhythmic, harmonic or temporal ruptures of texture will serve as means of segmentation. Thus, all of this will grant both perceptual coherence and creative intention. On the next slide, you can read the connection between analytical and performative tools. That said, I will present the application of the methodology. As you can see, there are three sequences of decisions. <coughs> the first one goes from an act of performance and through some analytical and semiotic tools to a certain acquisition of meanings. The inferences at this stage are the starting point for the second sequence of decisions in which these inferences set a new sense for the act of performing. Thirdly, the new sound realization marks another point of view that could nourish new interpretations in the field of semiotics. This circular approach can evolve over time and become a long-lasting method as it put in new semiotic and analytical tools 
as well as new angles to the performative act. I'll explain some of the employed tools. Here we can see an analysis of the main spectrum of nodes in the piece Lamento and how the intervallic play between major sixths and minor sevenths translates into semitones that produce what we call tears in Baroque rhetoric, le lacrime or il pianto, the sigh motif. On the next slide, we can see a horizontal display of the note spectrum and their interval relationships. Next, we can see the process of segmentations and the association with terrestrial isotopies. Let's listen. Here is another one, Isotopy and uh, his later development. And, and a third one that if you are so kind, we can listen to. Going further, I'll focus now on semiotic tools. As we can see, and following Tarasi's theory, we can analyze the initial chord in terms of speciality and any section in terms of temporality or actuality. I center myself in spatiality in this slide. For the distinction within the same term, we will base ourselves on processes of engagement or disengagement of musical events. As you could see now, we can apply the basic or the subsidiary states to the involved events. The first skirt has been listened to so we are going to listen to the fragment on the right, performed with the intention of creating a state of becoming. All this analysis is transformed into a sound fact through the piano performance, as you can see. The height of the pitch, the resonances, the shape of the phrase, and the drawing of the line condition the focus of the dynamics. Please listen. In the following case, the number of intervallic collisions and density of polyphony in each measure mark the sound realization.
coming to the end, I will show here an instance of direct applications or methodology. As you can see, these two passages are engaged and disengaged, are marked and marked by this building form. From the perspective of analytical or performative reading, we observe similar intervallic material in a different kind of drawing, metric setting, configuration and tempo. But if we filter all these under Tarasti's theory, the same material presents similarities and differences that will be useful for piano interpretation. If you are so kind, please listen to it. You can listen now how Sampronia, the composer, treats all this material in a very different way. Ending with the conclusions, a qualitative and not quantitative confirmation of the hypothesis can be stated. Namely, an interdisciplinary enrichment in the intertextual dialogue that leads us to performative consequences. For this purpose, a selection of readings, critical reflection and selection and discarding of semiotic proposals have been carried out through an approach of the semiotics field to contemporary repertoire. Performance and analysis have been tackled in two phases. A first one more intuitive and a second one rational and associative. The semiotic tools were selected and used by a guide of discursive sense and argumentative logic in the productive search for meaning. I've tried to position the act of performance as center of the study, but in the search for consilience, namely the junction of several fields of music knowledge. So thank you very much for your attention. I am sorry again for not being there and especially at this very moment. Since this is not possible, I would appreciate any input now or any ideas or pointers around via my email address. It's been a real pleasure. Good morning and thank you again. I do have one question. Have, have you tried to apply the same tools to other kind of repertories or, or just to its own space? Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm doing now because uh, in my PhD, uh, research I, I'm doing with uh, 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 Spanish compositions that were that uh, was made uh, in in the terms of contemporary repertoire, but that uh, are paying homage to some compositions in the past. I think that uh, I thought at first that it was uh, it would be a, a, 
a bit easier to apply all the all the media to all the means to to earlier compositions uh, because uh, in tonal music for instance we serve a common ground of culture inheritance so it will be easier and it will be more difficult uh, to apply it to some kind of repertoire that is not embedding on this kind of culture so i chose this this music uh, because the the lack of melody the lack of uh, uh tonal centers the lack of uh, some kind of building form could be tight could, could tighten or could exploit uh, my proposal in a in a more difficult way it it, it, it was uh in, in that terms for for this reason and uh, has the methodology developed or or is actually the same the, the, the methodology i think that it's a work on in progress uh but i think that uh, the main proposal is this kind of circular method in which um, from an intuitive uh, performance or first performance, you are building, you are constructing some kind of uh, semiotically informed performance. The, um, and uh, such as Professor Lakin said yesterday, any decision has to be motivated, uh, any decision in, in the performance terms. I thought in this way because uh, as a pianist student or teacher, uh, we are embedded in a oral tradition, but sometimes certain things needs a, fa a further justification, a further motivation. So I think the, the realm, the field of semiotics, it could be um, a place for this uh, justification. Uh, so some, sometimes you you can employ some tools, uh, but sometimes depending on the repertoire, you can use another tools or semiotic tools because are more productive. Uh, this this time maybe Hatton Santaras's uh, uh, positionings uh, guided by my analysis. Any more questions? So thank you very much, Miguel Angel. Thank you, Joel. I am from, from Poland, as I, as I said, from, from Poznan. Uh, and I would like to present some of my ideas uh, concerning musical gestures or performance gestures. But I would like to start from a short explanation of my position. I, uh, I um, I am a musicologist who is convinced that uh, uh, a very fruitful way to uh, explain musical phenomena uh, is the naturalistic paradigm. So, uh, so I believe that uh, music can be explained by the scientific tools in a similar way of as other natural phenomena, because I think that everything is to some extent natural, because we people are animals yeah, in, in some sense. And uh, from this point of view, we can think about music as a kind of signal, yeah, which is, which is um, produced by animals and received by other animals. So the, from the proximal point of view, the signals are produced at the beginning by, in, in the brain, and then they are sent by using either our vocal tracks or, or uh, our hands yeah, when we play musical instruments. And from this point of view, both rhythm and pitch are in fact uh, only the interpretation of uh, signals. So uh, maybe uh, I, I don't, don't know whether this point of view is still very popular, but I think that uh, 
uh, Western musicology uh, think about the music as of a phenomenon which is uh, something which is outside uh, our minds. But in fact, uh, I think that music uh, is co-created by human brains. This is just an interpretation of something which is coded in acoustic waves. Uh, and I know also that uh, semiotics, mainly the, the Persis semiotics, has nothing to do with uh, naturalism. But um, I know also that uh, semiotics uh, has been has been used in ethology to describe uh, animal communication. It, it is in fact very helpful to be, describe the differentiating between different kinds of signs which are and then signals which are produced by animals. So this is the reason why I, uh, I decided to speak about music signification. And this Congress is uh, devoted to performance. So I decided to present a view of the performance uh, performance gestures with, which accompany our music production or music uh, performance uh, and uh, performance uh, performance gestures of course are something which is not crucial for for music but they also can be interpreted as a kind of signal so let's start from something which seems to be very obvious that movement and, and the music uh, are strictly connected. And this is in, uh, not only my opinion, not just a cultural invention or just our, our choice. This is uh, because in fact, the production of music is related to the control of our muscles. And also the fact that the human brain during the processing of music is, uh, is also related, is also involved in the analysis of motor schemes in the motor cortex means that not only the motor cortex also in the subcortical areas, mainly in the striatum, but, uh, but here striatum is not depicted. Uh, but we know it also from our experience. Yeah? We want to move during, during listening to music. And even if in the Western tradition, when we are in the, the harmonic hall and we know that it is not good to move to music, yeah, if we, uh, if we uh, try to measure the brain activity of the listeners, uh, we realize that in fact, this is just a strategy of inhibition of our movement. And from the more general point of view, from the uh, point of view of ethnomusicology, music everywhere yes, is somehow related to, to movement. So this is, this is nothing surprising for me that also music, per, uh, that also during mu music performance, People just gesticulate. And this is this is just a part of additional expression, and there is a, a kind of very tight connection between our gestures and what we express by means of uh, sounds. So, but this is of course not the end of my uh, of my introduction because. These performance gestures can be different. And we can think about the relations between performance gestures and music uh, as a kind of uh, relations between different elements of music. Uh, and we can compare music to, to language. Linguists often uh, speak about uh, two different features of, of uh, language of uh, speech, of segmental features and suprasegmental features. And these segmental features are elements which are discrete, 
whereas the supra-segmental features are continuous. And the same we can say about music. Yeah, music is also in our mind uh, simultaneously experienced as composed of both something which is discrete and something which is indiscreet. Yeah, I, I intentionally speak about our minds because, uh, as I said, I believe that music is in our, our minds mainly, that uh, sounds, acoustical waves are only, uh, uh, are only the matter which trigger our musical interpretation. And from this point of view, the non-structural features of music, the analogy of supra-segmental elements in, in speech, our musical tempo, yeah, we can we can change the tempo and we experience tempo not in a uh, in a discrete way. Of course, we can describe tempo very precisely, uh, for example, by by means of metronome. Yeah, and, but this is only description. If we speak about our sensations, we sense the tempo as something which can change continuously. Yeah? Also, then the dynamics, the, the changes of loudness. Yeah, I know these ideas, especially in 20th century music, that we can uh, differentiate between discrete uh, elements of loudness. But in fact, from the psychological point of view, this is a very hard task. Yeah, so, uh, so in, the attempts in serialism to, to use the dynamics as something which is quantified. Yeah, it's rather intellectual than sensation. Also, timing the small changes of the durations of, of, of sounds uh, can be behind our quantification. We, we can't quantify sounds in terms of in terms of IOI, inter-onset intervals, and, and in some proportions, simple proportions. Also, articulation is something which is, in fact, all these elements are shared with. Uh, uh, with speech prosody, a speech prosody which is which is super segmental. I mean, to some extent, also the the, the slight changes in the uh, in F zero uh, of sound, so the slight the small changes in pitch can be uh, experienced, or the the wholeness of, of melody can be experienced in such, in such a way. So, from the uh, naturalistic point of view, we can characterize non-structural features as uh, features which are, first of all, evolutionarily very old. So in other words, the abilities that allow us to, to experience the non-structural features are not specific only to music, are not specific only to our species, but are shared by, by many animal species, mainly mammals. So what else? They are, as I said, they are perceived in a linear way. Yeah? They are non-generative. I, I will uh, expand the idea of generativity in music uh, a little later. Uh, Non-hierarchical. And we can, as I said, we can observe them in, uh, also in speech, but to some extent in crying and in, in, in laughter. Yeah? And, and also in some animals' uh, cries. Yeah? And what is um, maybe most important is that, that it seems that they are universally recognizing. If we use a crescendo yeah, and accelerando, we don't need any cultural background to feel that this is a signal of changing the intensity of, of our our um, experience, yeah? mostly emotional experience. But in contrast to these non-structural features, music are composed also from meter, as you know, rhythm, pitch structure, and sometimes harmony. Of course, from the Western perspective, harmony is uh, dominating element or a very important element, but from the ethnomusicological point of view, this is this is not as widespread as, as we can suspect. And what about structural features? They are evolutionarily young. Why? Because music 
is only human specific signal. I know that we use the words such as bird songs to describe the sound expressions of other animals, but there are some very smart uh, studies uh, which uh, show that birds, in fact, hear sounds, their melodies, their, their uh, vocal expressions quite different than, than humans. Yeah, so uh, we can suspect that not only this is human specific, but also they are different than abilities and, and features produced by these abilities when we speak. Because the segmental features of, of speech are based on different kinds of coding. Yeah, we, we code our speech mainly in temporal way and temporal and and we we do this uh, by spectral changes in, in sounds. Yeah, so this is what is the code say. But in 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 case of music, uh, what is the most important from the point of view of structural features is F0 as a, as a coder. So F0 influences mainly our sensation of pitch. And the quantifications of sounds in time, in terms of proportions, IOI, inter onset intervals. So they are perceived as discrete elements, or they are produced as discrete elements. They are hierarchical. Pitches are experienced as possessing some hierarchies in music. Yeah, some pitches are more important than others. I, I am convinced that you that you know the famous uh, book of Lerba and Jacquet about the generative theory of, of tonal music. So uh, they uh, their proposal is based on on this uh, on this uh, supposition. So apart from that. Uh, this is hierarchical, they are uh, hierarchically organized, they are also general. John Merker indicated in 2002 that not only language is an example of so-called uh, so uh, Humboldt, the Humboldt system, but also music. What does it mean? Humboldt system is a system which, is con which consists of a small number of discrete elements, which can be organized in an enormous number of expressions according to some rules. And we know uh, that, that speech is uh, an example of such a system, but also music is an example of such a system. What is also very important is that this system of structural features is more culture specific. Of course, we can also use the non-structural features to some extent as an as a element as a learnable element but in the case of uh, of uh, this features we need some knowledge cultural knowledge we, we don't need of course uh, lectures about this this knowledge but we uh, learn about uh, about the musical structure from our birth or even before our birth uh, by, by means of so-called statistical learn. Yeah? And as I said, they are music specifics. So from this point of view, we can we can speak about two types of musical syntax. One is metrorhythmical syntax or for, for simplicity, uh, just the rhythm syntax and pitch syntax. Uh, these two types of syntax uh, were described, for example, by, by Lerda and uh, Jacken. But what differentiates these syntaxes from language syntax is that they are detached from uh, the semantics, from, from propositional semantics, strictly speaking. Uh, the fact that pitches are organized hierarchically has nothing to do with the hierarchy in grammar. Hierarchy in grammar is based on, on the meaning of words to some extent. Yeah, but 
hierarchy in music is based on something which we can uh, describe as uh, the preconceptual features, preconceptual mind, some sensations, uh, some sensations of stability, for example, is a, a crucial sensation for, uh, for the hierarchy in music. And this is uh, also the reason why I refer why I refer to semiotics, but uh, the semiotics, the zoo, zoo semiotics of Seabock rather than uh, Pierce Persis uh, semiotics. So from this point of view, the rhythm syntax, let's start from this part of hierarchy, musical hierarchy, is cross -mode. Why I claim that this is cross -mode? Because we can express the hierarchy of rhythm syntax also in movement, for example, in dance. And we know that people do this, not only during performance, but during performance too, uh, not only during dance. But, uh, so from this perspective, the categories of rhythm can be understood as a kind of motor schemes in our brain, brains. Not only the schemes of sounds, but also mo motor schemes. If we clap to music, this is the realization of the, 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 the motor, motor schemes. Why this is possible to experience or to sense um, the rhythm syntax, even for people who, who are deaf or who lost, lost the sense of hearing. Because we know that we can detect during perception task, we can detect sounds not only by, by the means of hearing, by this uh, crucial for us sense. We know today that also vestibular system, the, system the, 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 the sense of balance, let's say, is able to detect sounds. This is not very fresh knowledge, but this is the end of the uh, 20th century that we recognize that this is possible. And this is not surprising from the biological point of view because the vestibular system, in fact, is located in the inner ear and it has uh, the, the common evolutionary sources with, with hearing. Yeah? This is located on the other side of, uh, of the inner ear. Right? And in, in, inside of the vestibular system, we, we have so-called hair cells, very similar to the hair cells in, our, uh, in, in the cochlea. Uh, and they are able to detect sounds, but, but the vestibular system is uh, dedicated or designed to, to measure the differences in balance. So this is unable to analyze the sound as well as in the cochlea. Also, we know that touch is a sense which is um, uh, able to, to detect the changes of acoustic energy only high changes and high energy with high amplitude, so-called Pacini and corpuscle, now they are here located in our skin, are in fact the biological tools <laughs> uh, which are able to detect the, the, the changes of acoustic energy. So these three additional uh, tools, or two additional senses are able to detect sounds, but they are unable to analyze sounds as well as, uh, as um, hearing. But we can also detect rhythm structure using just sight, yeah, because when we, when we watch the dancing, when we watch dancing people, to some extent we can experience the changes between beginning of, uh, of the actus yeah, and, and then so on. So what about pitch syntax? The second very important part of the structural features of music. As far as we know, it is impossible to, to recognize the pitch hierarchy 
without hearing. Why? Because hearing, yeah, this is uh, school knowledge, but I tend to, 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 to show you uh, the, the importance of this, this knowledge. This is the uh, this is the basilar membrane, membrane inside the cochlea, and this membrane is in fact a tool which analyzes sound uh, according to its spectral spectral elements. And spectral elements are crucial for for the recognition of pitch, so uh, they are important, especially for the recognition of pitch relations. Mm -hmm. So that the this homotopy, which is represented here in basilar membrane, which is differently sensitive to, to different you know, frequencies of sounds, yeah, are represented in our brain from the beginning of the um, uh, of the, our hearing system, from cochlea yeah, to brainstem, yeah, and then via midbrain to cerebral cortex. Yeah, and cerebral cortex, the first and second levels of cerebral uh, cortex, sorry, auditory cortex are tonotopic, which means that it is the, the, this part of brain is able to, to analyze pitch uh, according to pitch classes, let's say. And let's, oh, sorry. Let's compare uh, these two kinds of syntaxes. So for pitch syntax, we need spectral analysis, which is possible only thanks to hearing, whereas rhythm syntax necessitates temporal analysis, which is, which is also achievable by other senses. The relations of pitch syntax, however, give us some more freedom from time. Yeah, we can feel the relations between tonic and subtonic and then uh, uh, between next uh, pitches, let's say 10 seconds for 10 seconds. So, so, so pitch syntax is restricted only by our, our working memory, memory, whereas rhythm syntax depends on time. Yeah? And hierarchy, hierarchy of pitch syntax is achieved by the mechanisms, this is, of course, there are different theories now on the table, but the most convincing, and I think, is that proposed by, by David Huron, that, that pitch hierarchy is based on the, our prediction mechanisms. Yeah, so uh, depending on how, how predictable a particular pitch is, uh, influence, influence, influences the the, the level of stability, whereas the rhythm, the rhythm hierarchy is based on the sense of period, periodicity. And what is most important that pitch, maybe for, for my thesis, is that pitch syntax is unimodal, whereas rhythm syntax is intermodal. What does it mean for, for my presentation to, to conclude that Rhythm gestures, which uh, the, the performance gestures which accompanies our performance, uh, and this uh, and these gestures which are related to emphasizing the rhythm structure, uh, are able to transmit the signal about this structure, whereas. The gestures are that that we use to emphasize the pitch relations are poor in this task. We cannot send a signal about the pitch hierarchy by gestures. Of course, we can do this uh, in a conceptual way, as a, uh, using, for example, the old, very old ancient, not ancient, uh, middle ages tool of, of hand, yeah? But this is not the same as feel the, the higher, key pitch higher. Yeah? We can only infer this by, by concepts. Okay, I think that I was concise enough. Thank you <laughs> for your attention. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much. Welcome. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for your fantastic presentation and for providing us with the biological basis for the perception of music. It's very uh, interesting for us here. And I want to ask you about the case of Evelyn Glennie. Probably you know this yeah. person because she claims, uh, as, as you probably know, um, she lost uh, her hearing at the age of 12, but she continued to uh, uh, continued her musical education as a percussion player. And she claimed that she was able to compensate her loss of hearing by means of other senses. Do you think it's possible? To some extent, thank you for this question, because uh, the example of Glenn is, uh, is a very good example to analyze or to compare these two kinds of uh, music experience. Uh, as far as I know, I, I read uh, uh, some of some Glenn's claims, uh, some claims about uh, her experience. Yes, he is able to compensate rhythm entirely. He plays music without shoes. Yeah, so I think that the Pacini and Barbasso actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I. I think that she is able to compensate the sense of rhythm using the Pacini and Colpasso, yeah, and also the transmission uh, of uh, acoustic wave uh, via uh, via bones is a is a tool to to trigger the hair cells in our vestibular system. But as far as I know. He is unable to feel the pitch higher. He can, he is, she, sorry. <laughs> she can infer or even sense, broadly speaking, whether a pitch is lower or, or higher. Mm -hmm. But this is not the same as the experience of tonic or dominant. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, the, um, the slide about the syntax in music, I think. Yeah. Yeah. This one. This yeah. one yes. I have a question regarding what um, what you call type of hierarchy uh, concerning pitch syntax and the line prominence based on frequency pitch curves. If I understand you correctly. Uh, this would mean that uh, we would perceive the prominence of a certain pitch or pitch class in relation to the frequency uh, with which it occurs. Exactly. I have a slight problem with this because I think that, uh, for instance, if you consider the prominence of the topic, uh, you can very well have a melody that avoids the topic completely or almost and still. Um, it is there, but virtually. So, this is my question number one. What will you make of it? And my question number two uh, is more of a suggestion. I'm actually wondering myself, but uh, I always find it a little bit suspicious uh, to think of pitch as an exclusively discrete dimension because most people actually um, who don't have uh, what they call perfect pitch. Mm -hmm. uh, the actual uh, reality of a specific pitch doesn't exist, doesn't really play a role in, in, in perception. What you can see is pretty much relation between mm -hmm. pitches, intervals, and uh, the general sense of the, the contour of, of the melody. You don't need. I have the feeling that sometimes we give too much prominence to the idea of uh, discrete pitches because of rotation because it's taking a rotation tool but in fact what you hear most of the time is contours it's um melodic profile what what are you going to call it would you be prepared to accept this idea and uh, what consequences you can have in your theory okay so thank you for this, this question these two questions very important questions uh, this is a, a shortage of, uh, of course. Uh, in the music psychology, there are two 
maybe not still, but then there, there, there were two proposals to explain the I am answering to the first question, to the to the uh, pitch hierarchy. One was proposed by Carl Kromhansel in 1990s and, and her very famous book, uh, musical, the musical pitch, as far as I remember. And she uh, actually uh, claimed uh, that um, uh, that the pitch hierarchy depends on the frequency of uh, occurrence of a particular uh, pitches in a such a sense that the more a particular pitch of course, the more stable it is, the, the, the higher in the hierarchy is. But they need Huron. Yes, this is this is not true, and this uh, this explanation was um, uh, rejected. Uh, let let to say uh, it was um, uh, it was proposed on the basis of some uh, some psychological research. Uh, she uh, observed that pitch hierarchy and and made major and minor modes uh, that people in, in western countries are quite they they, they agree about uh, this hierarchy and she compared uh, this schemes with the statistics of the occurrence of pitches but not not everything uh, was uh, perfect in this comparison and david Hura Proposed another explanation because this this Kuhnhansel explanation is is called the um, uh, what is the, the name of this theory? This is this is uh, uh, effect of effect of occurrence. Yeah, I, I I forgot the, the original name, but the proposal that Hughes proposal is called prediction effect. What does it mean? It means that our, according to him and many others, and there are very, very interesting research now, our brains instantly calculate the probability of the occurrence of the next pitch according to our previous experience, but this is not just the absolute occurrence. This is just the, the comparison of occurrence of a, of a particular pitches after Previous pitches. This is a very complex mechanism, but very well mathematically described. Uh, and this is also not perfect, but it 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 fits much better the reality than the Krumhaus than Krumhaus Krumhansel proposal. But as far as I know, and this is very logical from the biological point of view, we cannot believe that one mechanism can explain the whole uh, cognitive phenomenon because the brain uh, is a big simultaneous machine and which means that that many different strategies are used so maybe also uh, acoustic elements can somehow influence this uh, you know that 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 we can we we can experience a particular pitch, even if the F0 is removed from, from the pitch. Yeah? So this is the creative power of, of our brain. So if it works at the level of the interpretation of one pitch, it must be also possible in the interpretation of the, of the series, series of pitches. So, so this is definitely somehow based on our experience. Yeah? So this is the answer to the first your first question, and the answer answer to your second question. Yes, I agree with you entirely that if that that the discrete pitch is not this do, do not the same as pitch class in theory, and this is not related only to people who possess absolute pitch. Uh, I use the term discrete in in reference to pitch interval. And as far as I know from music psychology, even people who don't know anything about music theory, they recognize differences between pitch intervals quite well. There is uh, yes, sir, but I was thinking about you know the gesture is already I know. What, the gesture of the melody and such, rather than the individual. You recognize yeah. the gesture before you 
Yes, exactly. Entirely. At the beginning of my maybe I was not not uh, very uh, very clear what I said. At the beginning, I uh, I uh, showed the slide with two elements: uh, super segmental and segmental elements of music. So we use our gestures are connected to both of these elements. But then I talked only of of the second one. Yeah, but the of course. These gestures that are related to pitch contour are, are more obvious and they predominate the, our, our gestural expression, I think, the performance. Yeah, yeah, next for your presentation. I would like to first share my point of view and then ask you in order to talk on a I could I have a better understanding. Mm -hmm. I think that music has a signification to the fact that music is in itself a cultural object. And object? Yes, mm -hmm. object. Uh, uh, music in its religion has been used in rituals and many other events like that. So I think that from the beginning of the music history, it has been related to a cultural factor. On the other hand, uh, you said <coughs> that music is like numbers in like our minds, our brain. And, uh, but I think that frequency by itself has no meaning. A person, I think that a person gives a signification to these frequencies when from his beliefs that are learned by a culture of that specific society. He or she reflects about his background and many other experiences and then give a signification. And, in the case I, for example, reflect how these frequencies are inside our brains, uh, I would like to, well, I would think that, for example, that in all over the world, in ordinary conditions, people have the same tools to listen to the same beats. But for example, there's many tribes in, in Africa that listening and trying to understand in the same beats, they don't achieve to the same signification. So in this context, I would like to ask you, how would I have a better understanding about your beliefs about music? Thank you. Very, 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 very interesting question. From this point of view, I can answer yes and not, <laughs> in a sense that there is a group of, group of musical features, a group of sound features, which are universally recognizable. And there is a group of musical features yeah. which are culture specific. And the example of frequency is a good example because our sensation of pitch is multi-dimension. So that from the, from the psychoacoustic point of view is only one dimension of pitch. Yeah, we can organize uh, pitch from the low to the high. Or, if you want, you can use other metaphors. But in music, we have another, another, but strictly speaking, two other, two other uh, dimensions. One is the dimension, the discrete dimension of, of intervals, and this discrete dimension depends on our learning. So when we try to tune a violin, we use our ability to recognize the first dimension because we want to be as precise as, as we can. But when we listen to a musical structure, this is not so important whether someone uh, on, viol on violin play this pitch a little bit higher or yeah, in terms of the frequency, in terms of hands. But what is important is the recognition of the cultural specific interval. And in our in our culture, we use the, the twelve tone system. Yeah? But in other cultures, people use different systems, and they recognize um, um, this dimension, this pitch dimension, different because perce perception is not the the. Strictly speaking, perception is the detection of the changes of energy, but in terms of, uh, of, of our conscious experience, this is a comparison what is detected with the pattern which are in our mind. 
and the patterns are learned during our experience. So this is the answer. <laughs> Can we have three, three more? Thank you for talk. Uh, my question has to be with this pattern of uh, inside our mind and the uh, uh, creative capacity of the brain. How about the the the, the music we, we don't listen to or the music we are uh, we had already inside and the, or the imagination of music like uh, um, well we can talk we can uh, remember Beethoven composing uh, uh, that and so uh, what about this what about the the the, the, the the music that is that the music, uh, the music language is not something that is inside our brain. That just what we listen from outside is just uh, 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 feeling what we have already. We have already an imagination of what music is. Yes, I think that this is a good metaphor, but uh, I think that we should emphasize that this is not whatever whatever we want, right? because our mm -hmm. mental music, even if we don't listen to any sounds, yeah, is always based on some elements and some elements which we had to hear previously. Memory. Yeah? Because memory is composed of mental patterns and these patterns can be as as small as one interval yeah? but they still are the matrix of our perception but but this is more true for the structural features and less true for uh, maybe not less true but the character of the patterns of non-structural features is different but still it is somehow learned Nothing yet. I, I don't like the I don't like the very popular uh, metaphor or very popular uh, division between nature and culture. Between because nothing is entirely natural and nothing is entirely cultural. This is a kind of in, interwoven interdependencies. Yeah, I I, I would add another. Yeah, I mean, it's not what we call music, not this memory. I mean, this is what we have inside that we, we are back to the other kinds of communication. So we, we, we just keep this, this what we have already. Okay, you mean in, in the case of in, in Beethoven's case? Yeah, no, 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 no. In, in, in Beethoven's case, uh, also, but I mean, generally speaking, the, uh, that the the what we call music is memory Me memory of of sounds that we are our brain are capable to keep yes to some to some extent yeah uh, i think that what we actually analyze from score we is uh, or are the, the mental patterns but I would like to emphasize that, that these patterns are not uh, not independent of nothing. Mm -hmm. well, that acoustic acoustic uh, waves are important. Yeah, this is acoustic waves are the, the medium in which music is coded. Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your fascinating presentation. Uh, in this presentation, you have uh, discussed some aspects that would transcend the limits of the human species. And uh, among your statements, the, uh, you have emphasized uh, a specific role to mammals uh, with respect to other species. And, uh, I'd like to share with you an episode and then uh, listen to your observations regarding that, because uh, maybe it conflicts a little bit with this vision. 
You are probably uh, aware of Johannes Kepler's uh, Harmonicus Mundi, mm -hmm. in which he summarizes a little bit of the Pythagorean tradition and proposes that uh, music would be some kind of reflection of astronomical relations in which there would be musical intervals and rhythms. And so, of, of course, that would be something that might be perceived by any card, uh, any kind of species, not the human species. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, some weeks ago, we had a lunar eclipses. And uh, I spent half of the week in, in the middle of the forest in my country house, which is in a national park. And, and in that moment, uh, I was working in, in a, an article that was sent to Jean-Marie Jacono, our colleague. And I, I had to work all through the night. And there was a, a phenomenon there that was really interesting that uh, normally the forest is very noisy. Uh, Philologos uh, <laughs> use that, you know, there are lots of rhythms, lots of intervals uh, simultaneously, there is polyrhythmy, there is, uh, uh, and there is this counterpoint, but uh, during the night, there was a moment in which the, the forest silenced, absolutely silenced. And I, I was a bit surprised by that. And uh, when I- uh, During the eclipse. Yeah? Yes, during the eclipse, <laughs> exactly. And, and at that moment, when I uh, just looked up in the sky because it was open air, I could see that the, the moon had disappeared in that moment. Uh, it was all covered. And uh, the, the insects had stopped. You know, the cicadas had stopped. The birds had stopped. The, uh, the wolves had stopped, everybody had silenced there. And then I was late with my article, so there I was back <laughs> writing, 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 and after just a moment, the nature exploded, exploded. You could see the roosters, you could see the holies of the wolves, you could see the cicadas coming back. And then when I looked up, the moon was back, full, you know? In this aspect, it, it comes to my mind that uh, many species were celebrating that moment, that there was a, <laughs> exactly, that there was a plane of content that was being expressed in different musical ways by different species. And I would by no means uh, privilege mammals with respect to insects or amphibians or birds with respect to that. So I'd like to listen to your, your observations with respect thanks to an episode like that. Remember that, for example, when you have a solar eclipse, uh, it's well known that roosters will silence and chicken will go to sleep and come back. But this was not a solar eclipse. It was not uh, related to mechanical uh, responses. Uh, no, it was a lunar eclipse. So it's something uh, really uh, interesting with respect to that. Uh, could I listen to you? <laughs> I am not a biologist. Yes. <laughs> what I can, I, I, I you know, I don't uh, don't believe. Maybe this is the wrong word. I try to look up for as simple explanations as it is possible, and, uh, including into explanation of of such an event, uh, the idea of feast, a human specific idea of feast, um, is uh, from my point of view dangerous. Mm -hmm. I think that it must be another way of explaining this fact, maybe just the fact that that lunar eclipse is something uh, special, something unexpected. Because maybe. it's unrelated to the cycle, <laughs> to the biological cycle of species. The solar eclipse, it's related, it's deeply related, but yeah. not the lunar eclipse. The, that's something <laughs> different, really. Yes, but lunar eclipse occurs during the night, yeah? Or yes, in the middle of the night, night. so it was not uh, approaching the sun, the sunrise. No, it was in the middle. 
a possible another explanation is that uh, Luna is also a source of light, not strictly speaking. Yeah? It's, uh, uh, it is not a source, in fact, it reflects uh, sight from the sun. But uh, during the lunar eclipse, uh, the night is darker. And uh, Yes, but birds will see the same way without the full moon. Yes, and the, the, too. the changes of darkness means that uh, that sound signals can be can be generating sound sound signals can be more dangerous yeah, because you know producing sound is just a signature. I am here, yeah, so. So it can be dangerous, yeah, in a sense that, that all predatory animals can easily detect. It's not really white, the predatory animals. I'm <laughs> into this explanation. <laughs> uh, yes, I invite and I that, uh, that, you know, I try to avoid human specific. Uh, not ideas, this is also an idea produced by humans, but you know, fasting, music, yeah, speaking, all these activities are not observed in animals, yeah, but uh, predation and, and, uh, and hiding from predation is something which is universal strategy among, among the whole animal world. Yeah, so this is simpler to refer to to this kind of events than to, to something which is just a kind of human-specific interpretation. <laughs>